Raptors tie franchise marks with 48 wins and 22 road wins, secure home court advantage, and have won six of eight. But are we still mad? Raptors Weekly starts now. of eight i tell you six of eight wins the raptors have they've got 48 wins they've tied the all-time franchise mark they could hit 50 but andrew thompson as he joins me will tell us if he's still mad about the raptors for some reason still mad about the raptors yeah you still angry you at them bro there's a difference between being mad like this is something that that the internet's not real good at at figuring out the nuances of there's a big difference between being mad and hating and just not being full of blossoming optimism are you are you so I'm guessing you're not full of blossoming optimism. Uh, I would say that I am I am concerned. Yes. Mm. But team has been playing really well. 6 of 8. Uh they've hit some goals that uh, they've set early in the season. Uh they're I think one of the goals that they set was 50 wins as Lou Williams spoke after the uh uh after the win yesterday against uh who did they play yesterday? Uh, they Miami. played Miami, yeah, and uh, he spoke of the 50 win total, which they might get. So there's some, there's definitely some positivity and optimism in the Raptors locker room. But Andrew, why hasn't that translated into the uh, into the fan uh, fan spectrum? Uh, because they've won six of eight games, and they've done it by edging out one, two, or three point victories over teams that are going into the lottery. So. At the yes, same time, at the same time, I'll play devil's advocate. Orlando right, right. had won three straight, and they had been playing really well. Granted, it's the end of the season. Miami was fighting for their playoff lives, if you will. Uh, so those are two wins that, on the road, back-to-back, they, there's some level of impressiveness in there. Yeah, I'm not saying the other teams are trying to give it to them. They're not, it's not like they're, they're trying to lose, but... It's it doesn't you don't want you didn't watch the Orlando game you didn't watch the Boston game you didn't watch the Miami game and you and see that team and think all right like you know what this is this is a team that can take it to Atlanta in the second round this is a team that has a chance to do something ah so so at least we're talking about second round now and <laughs> and and let's uh, let's talk about the first round before we get that far Andrew yeah uh, we got so last week we spoke about all about uh, or two weeks ago that Washington is an inevitability but now it seems like uh, it's going to be Milwaukee because uh, the Raptors and Bulls are uh, have the same record and despite losing all four to the Bulls the Raptors hold the tiebreaker and are currently in the third seed and, and Milwaukee's basically uh, etched in pretty strong at the sixth seed yeah they lost uh, the sixth seed yeah they they got that down. Uh, and the only way the Raptors play the Wizards now is if uh, somehow Chicago, uh, you know, finishes with a better record. And looking at Chicago's last two games, at Brooklyn, who have been playing really well and are trying to uh, lock down that eighth seed, and Atlanta, who might be resting players, but still, it's uh, it's Atlanta. Uh, so, and the Raptors, uh, on the other hand, face Boston and Charlotte. Charlotte, who's uh, who have players out, and uh, it's a home game. And Boston, obviously, is going to be a tough one. So the most you could see the Raptors going here is one and one. Uh, and that's the most you can probably see Chicago going. So Milwaukee, it is, I guess. Yes, yeah, uh, ESPN's broken it down to about a 74% chance that the Raptors play Milwaukee with 24% that they play Washington and then like 1% each for Brooklyn and Boston. So mm-hmm. it's, it's overwhelmingly likely that they play Milwaukee, which mm-hmm. I'm happy about. And it seems like most people were more leaning towards Washington. Mm-hmm. So we'll we'll talk about that in greater detail later on in the podcast. But first, let's get some props to some uh, some players who've been playing really well. Uh, the first one being uh, Demar Derozan, who yeah. uh, you know, despite uh, some of the bad losses that have that have happened this month, uh, uh, the Brooklyn one, the Boston one, there's one theme which has been consistent. And that's Demar Derozan's strong play. Uh, like right now, uh, over the last ten games, and this doesn't even count the the Miami game. Like he's been shooting forty five percent. He's hitting 39% from three. He's averaging 24 points and uh, 4.6 assists. For the rest of the season, the numbers are significantly lower. So the last 10 games, he's playing fantastic ball. I'd even say that he's playing the best basketball of his career going into the postseason. So that's got to fill you with some sort of optimism that you early indicated you lacked. Well, it's it's unquestionably the best shooting performance of his career. I mean, he's never sniffed anything close to 40% from three. I think his... I don't think he's ever finished a season over 30, I think 30% even might be the best he's ever done from three. He's about a 26, 27% career three-point shooter. So these are great numbers for him there. And I think you hit it on the head when you said strong play. Like he looks like he's playing physically strong. He's got a lot more confidence in his body and his aggression is actually having results. He's getting lift. He's powering through guys and he's getting to the rim. And that's something that we didn't see from him for a long time after coming back through the, the hip injury. 
And, and it's a complete game too. Like when he came back from the injury, his focus was more on ball distribution and assists, not so much on uh, scoring. Or at least he was sh shooting a very poor percentage. But now it's coming together. He's shooting a high percentage, and yet he's having good, uh, good assist play. Like he's distributing the ball. And the most important thing for me, at least, is that. His clutch play has been very strong, as in as yesterday against Miami, he had that huge three point play. So all aspects of his game are kind of rounding up. At this point, he just needs some uh, needs some help. Yeah, he needs a lot of help. So yeah. Then, sorry, go ahead. Well, uh, help is coming in the in the form of Tyler Hansbro these days. Uh, That's enough. With the, That's with, enough. Uh, I, I I know you don't like Hansbro. I, I know you think he's too small to play in the NBA. That he dominated boys in college and gets overrun by men in NBA. But hey, man, over the last few games with Amir Johnson out, Tyler Hansbro has been the optimal Dwayne Casey defender because he's been able to hedge. He's been able to rotate back. He's mobile. And last night, uh, I believe, uh, or two nights ago, he had a steal at half court and ran it back for a full court for a jam. Did you Did you happen to catch that one? I, I did catch that. It didn't overwhelmingly sway my long sample size opinion of him, but it, it was nice. Look, he's actually, he has played fairly well recently. Um, he's played better than I would have thought he was. He's really kept his fouls down while playing longer minutes, which is impressive. Um, he's done a, a better job than most as, as you're talking about, as far as attacking and then recovering out of the pick and roll. Um, it's important to note that like he's, He's playing a lot of these minutes against teams that aren't going to be in the playoffs or are the eight seed when they should not be the eight seed, and and he's playing against you know not top line starters, but so, which is me trying to just say like look, don't don't buy the hype as far as what you're seeing here, but he's played very well for him. I still would very much worry if he's playing more than four or five minutes a game in the playoffs. Four or five minutes, really? Uh, even yeah. even I against a, a team like Milwaukee, that that does. Uh kind of test your mobility and and you know that amir johnson isn't that mobile of a, of a defender anymore like do you well yeah but here's the thing again if we're talking about tyler hansborough playing you know 10 12 15 20 minutes in a game then we're talking about much like we saw this week we're talking about james johnson getting another dnp coach's decision we're talking about amir johnson playing very limited minutes we're talking about valentunas not playing more than 20 minutes like that those are the results in the playoffs you're going to be going with a really small rotation and the more minutes hansborough gets it's going to be coming at the expense of a Patrick Patterson and Amir Johnson or a Jonas Valanciunas or James Johnson. And I'm not really sure if that's a trade that I think is in our favor. I don't know if it's that, if it's that, uh, that's direct, like more Hansbro equals less of other people. You don't have to necessarily shorten the rotation to that degree. And I, I don't think Casey will, I think his rotation will continue to stay. It'll have a long tail basically. And, uh, um, I don't know. I, I just think that he's added Dwayne Casey likes his defense to stretch out to, to mm -hmm. really help and have the ability to come back and, and defend the paint once they do that. And Hansbro, uh, granted, it's been against somewhat weaker opposition, but he's been able to fulfill that role to a degree better than Amir Johnson has for, I'd say, the last month. Uh, so yeah. th th It's also worth noting that, that this, these last stretch of games where he's played deep minutes have been against teams with absolutely no shooting. Like there's been very little to no threat of teams spacing the, the court and really moving the ball around and killing us that way. It, it does make the pick and roll a lot easier to defend. Mm -hmm. and, and how does Milwaukee shoot? Very bad. So there you go then. So bad. So there you go. With the exception of Chris Middleton, who's going to make all the money this summer. There you go. So uh, uh, Tyler Hansbrough fans, uh, <laughs> your hero will be playing a lot of minutes in the playoffs. Uh, so two guys you want to touch on uh, is uh, Grievous Vasquez, who uh, – in the last pod, we said uh, with, with James Herbert from uh, CBS Sports joined me, and uh, we talked about how Vine has basically ruined Grievous Vasquez. Okay. And every single mistake he makes, it just immediately vined out, and people just laugh at him, and then he becomes this lightning rod of controversy for our defense. When I really feel that he's not the problem, he's just a symptom of a larger of a deeper issue with Dwayne Casey's defense. So he becomes kind of the whipping boy for everybody when it comes to defense. When really. When you pick him, when you when you choose to give him minutes, you also take on the responsibility of hiding him on defense. So putting him, you know, against Tyreek Evans at the end of games, <laughs> or uh, yeah, or, or or against uh, Mario Chalmers in a post up position, or, or all these things, it's down to the coach. I don't think we should be getting mad at Vasquez for uh, you know for being a poor defender. As long as he's shooting fifty percent, he's not looking off people, he's hitting his jumpers. That's kind of all you ask of him. 
Uh, I mean, you certainly have a point when you talk about the misuse of Grievous Vasquez. I think we've all pulled our hair out at one point or another this season when he's getting subbed in late for key defensive possessions. Uh, I think there is something going beyond Vine and the, just the singular mistakes. There's definitely something to the fact that Vasquez was a really big positive whenever he played with Kyle Lowry last year. Uh, in point differential or even just with the starters in general compared to this year in a much larger sample size when him and Kyle Lowry are on the floor together the Raptors are a negative a net a net negative when he plays in the starting lineup with either instead of Lowry or instead of Ross the starters who are all net positives otherwise are notable net negatives so hmm. he has been a problem when he's played large stretches of minutes in those roles uh, and he's gotten burned badly by starting caliber level guards, especially since the Raptors have used him more often than not at more of a two guard. Uh, his assist numbers are way, way down his assist percentage, his assist to turnover ratio from normal. But he's I mean, I, I, I tend to cringe when he spots up from three as much as he often does. But he's shooting 37 percent from three. He's doing a good job of spot up shooting. So there is that he hasn't necessarily been as bad as it maybe seems like, but not just in how he's used as far as individual defensive possessions, but the lineups that he's playing with have sometimes been a misuse of him that's hurt the Raptors. Mm -hmm. And uh, like uh, some credit needs to be given to Dwayne Casey for like somewhat diversifying the uh, the offense over the last little while. I think we've seen uh, a lot more of Patrick Patterson's game. Like he's been doing a lot of driving, uh, you know, driving pull-ups or just drives. Last night he threw a huge dunk over uh, Hassan yeah. Whiteside. Uh, there's been a lot more pick-and-roll play. Uh, albeit not that successful all the time. Uh, I think James Johnson, when he does play, ha has been given a little more freedom to just drive on his own a little bit. There's a lot of play with Terrence Ross as the ball handler. Again, it doesn't work out all the time, but he's made some efforts to uh, diversify the offense and at least not be so predictable. And uh, and and one stat that I picked up on um, was a uh, pick and roll play. Uh, the Raptors are you know they're not a great pick and roll team because they just don't attempt to run any r run as many of them. Uh, but on pick and roll plays, only five percent of their pick and roll plays, of of the, all their plays, are pick and rolls which go back to the man. So once you, yeah. once the point guard sets the screen, only five percent goes back to the man. That's an extremely low number for a team that has good finishers at that position with Amir Johnson and even Valanciunas. Uh, and all of their guys are near the top in as far as field goal percentage and finishing as pick and roll big men. They just don't get the chance. Right, and, and with that play. 18% of plays are basically after the pick, after the high screen, the point guard just does what he wants. So it never comes back to the big man. He either shoots or he passes uh, to the weak side. So the pick and roll is something that the Raptors have not utilized at all, despite having the weapons, I guess, to do so. Yeah, I wrote about this a little bit earlier on in the year when I was talking about some of the Raptors' bigs. And I think the problem there is twofold. And one is that the ball handlers like DeMar DeRozan, Kyle Lowry, though to a little bit lesser extent than some of the other guys, and Lee Williams, those guys all are more likely to keep the ball than to pass the ball, and the scouting report is pretty clear on that. And so teams just both sort of they, – they spend both guys just trying to take away the ball handler. And when you commit to that, it makes it really hard for them to move the ball over because they know that they're not – a guy like DeMar is not great at moving the ball over, so you just bring both guys over to him. Lou Williams is almost definitely going to shoot, so you, you don't – you try to take that away. And, and I think the other half of that is that the Raptors are spending so much time getting into their offense. I think this is their biggest offensive problem is that they take eight, nine, sometimes ten seconds – just to get their first action started. And by the time they're trying to actually run a pick and roll, they've got four or five seconds left on the shot clock. So you have a lot of frantic decisions that are made at the end of a pick and roll or during the middle of a pick and roll because you can't reset or you can't let something develop because you need to get a shot off in two seconds. Mm. And if they want to get a good pick and roll game going, then they do some things that are trying to emulate a little bit of a Spurs style type basketball. And the problem is, there's a, a team like the Spurs or the Hawks are trying to get two, three, sometimes four different pick and rolls in the same possession, just breaking the defense down until you have something that develops well. And the Raptors spend so much time moving the ball up the court and then trying to get a dribble handoff at the side and get something going that they have time for one pick and roll. And if you take it away, then it is gone and someone's forcing a shot. Mm. Uh, let's talk about Lou Williams uh, just a little bit before we uh, take a break and come back with some Twitter questions. Uh, uh, Huge play yesterday. He was matched up against uh, yeah. who was he matched up against? Johnson. Uh, yeah, some, some some guy uh, yeah, on we Miami. Are professional reporters, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. 
<laughs> and uh, clear out three game over ice. Again, we talked about DeMar DeRozan being in great form heading into the playoffs. Lou Williams, uh, over the last two to three weeks, we've seen a lot more. We've seen a lot of good point guard play for him. Uh, the clear outs are still there. I think as Will tweeted, you know, a play would be nice, but when those uh, ISOs go in, it looks great. Uh, but something to be said about uh, Lou Williams, Lou Williams uh, heading into the playoffs. Uh, another positive, I guess, uh, for the Raptors. Yeah, I mean, he's playing well. He's he's scoring. He's doing exactly what we need. He's probably going to win six men of the year. You think so? I, I mean, I don't. I think he's been great, and I just I just don't know who's going to take that from him. Mm. Like, like Gobert, Isaiah Thomas. Isaiah Thomas got traded. Mm-hmm. Um, his teammates didn't want to play with him where he was before, mm. and Gobert has been a starter for as long or more than he was a six man. So, mm. well, uh, uh, Brad Stevens is uh, openly. Uh, you know, calling for uh, Isaiah Thomas to be six man of the year. I think I think he had a huge. Uh, for sure. Uh, yeah, he's well. That, that's what coaches do, I guess. Uh, I don't think Dwayne Casey's gone on record to say something like that, but uh, Brad Stevens definitely is, uh, is is pulling for his man. Um, let's take a quick break, man, and and uh, we've got a lot of Twitter questions, and we'll pick a few and and uh, see what the what the fans' pulse is during this uh, exciting time. Okay. of the podcast we're doing some twitter questions and topics uh see what the fans are saying so uh andrew uh, you ready for this you ready all right the first question comes from uh raps fan 1237 and uh he talks about lowry's minutes allocation coming off of injury yeah um so funny story uh, against orlando uh kyle lowry played 33 minutes and uh in uh Dwayne Gacy's post-game press conference, he said, yeah, he played way too many. That's just too many. Uh, the minutes got a bit mismanaged today. It's a mistake. Uh, shouldn't happen again. And then uh, a night after, uh, in Miami, back-to-back, he played 36. Yeah. But but nobody actually asked Casey, uh, you know, <laughs> what happened there. But uh, talk to me. Is he, is he playing too many, too many minutes uh, coming off an injury? I don't know exactly how he's feeling, what percent his back is at, but if he's playing at less than 80% and he's still trying to be heal, and they're putting him out there for 36 minutes a game, I would say that's a problem. I would say it's a lot more important for him to be as close to 100% in the playoffs than it is for him to play an extra nine minutes because the Raptors need to try and beat Orlando. Yeah, that's the thing, right? Uh, and he and he was playing hard. It's not like he was just out there coasting. Uh, he was driving. Uh, he was he was missing a lot of shots, uh, taking a lot of shots, expending a lot of energy. Obviously, the last thing you want to do at this point is aggravate something. Uh, but really, Dwayne Casey, maybe his approach now is just to like Tom Stop Tom Thibodeau him uh, yeah. <laughs> until he gets back in shape. I, I have no. I I was surprised at at the heavy minutes usage. Uh, well, uh, it's surprising too when a coach is like, "Oh, he played way too many minutes tonight." It's like that. Well, that's one of, one of your jobs <laughs> is to make sure that he doesn't do that. Like that's. I'm not sure who he's throwing under the bus. Like that. That's not something you should realize after the fact. Like, oh dear. Like that. Like, come on. Like this is what you're doing. Yeah. And then to do it the next night after you called yourself out for doing it is. Yeah. Yeah. Not very self-aware, that's for sure. And uh, like right now, it's not an issue. But if Lowry reaggravates something before the postseason or misses a playoff game, like we're gonna look back at this time and go, I think we kind of screwed that up. Even if he just isn't able to play at his full potential in the playoffs, mm. I mean, it's it's a thing. Mm. If he's not a hundred percent healthy. I don't know why he's playing at all. Hmm. Well, but at the same time, we should say that I mean, you know, the medical staff the Raptors have were assuming that you know they have some input onto how many minutes a player plays, and uh, they were presumably okay with Lowry playing so many minutes on a, on a back to back coming right off of injury. Uh, sure, and I'm also I'm also sure that Lowry wants to play and is probably wanting to play this many minutes. Like I, I feel like that's probably a role too. Yeah, but, but players always want to play. That's not exactly. that's always the case. It, it, it's about somebody being the uh, the saner mind and saying, yeah, dude, you just missed like seven games. Uh, your back is sore. Back's a very sensitive area. Let's want, want we ease in 15 and 20, and then we can get you to 35 by season's end, not uh, yeah. 33 and 36 found, and back-to-back yeah. nights. It turns out the team pays me to safeguard the future of the franchise, not mm-hmm. just you know moving forward in years, but like for two weeks from now instead mm-hmm. of just tonight. Yeah. A uh, follow-up question from uh, the same uh, Raps fan, 1237, is uh, – Devlin's agonizing no call saying. So you know what I'm talking about here, right? So when uh, when a Raptor drives to the rim and uh, there's no foul, he'll always say contact, no call, implying somewhat that uh, the Raptors are getting hosed by the refs. Uh, 
yeah, it's annoying, man. Uh, it's been annoying for quite some time now. But at this point, I've kind of learned to tune it out and kind of kind of accept the devilinisms as they as, as they come. I've learned to tune out Devlin t- to the extent of that I just don't listen with the volume on. I do. I just don't pay any attention to the announce. I can't do it. I'm sorry. I just. I, so I'm what do you sure got on? What do you I'm listen sure to during the game? I will listen to nothing. I will have the volume just off, and Isn't I will. That just, awkward. You know what's awkward? Listening to Jack Armstrong and Matt Devlin. That is hello. <laughs> All right, fine. I can't uh, do it. Can't do it. Okay. Yeah, uh, Raps Fan 1237, it's very annoying, man, but you just got to deal with it. Uh, we have ball streams uh, for Rappers Republic, which is the account that people share. And uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the other announcer, the uh, other team's announcing team, uh, I usually listen to that because uh, you always get a different perspective on how, how they see the Raptors. And it's always way more interesting than kind of have Devlin and Leo repeat the same thing over and over again. And, and, and same with Jack Armstrong. I mean, as nice of a dude he is, it's a... Uh, uh, it's painful at this point to listen to the same guys over and over again. So if you have the chance, you know, on, on League Pass or Ball Streams, definitely it's very enjoyable to see what other people, uh, other experts, I guess, uh, think of the Raptors. Yeah, you can listen to the same thing on League Pass, but you have to live, you know, outside of Canada in order to actually watch the Raptors on League Pass. So, Well, there's something called VPN, Andrew, which we won't get into here, but uh, yeah, 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 it's something technical. Yeah. All right. Let, let's move on to a hot topic, and that's James Johnson. Uh, the question comes from uh, at Dylan Littman, and he goes, uh, why did James Johnson only play four minutes when Terrence Ross was playing through a hurt ankle? Uh, he's referring to the um, the Orlando game here where uh, Terrence Ross was actually went to the locker room with a, with a sore left ankle or sore ankle. And um, despite that, uh, Dwayne Casey chose to extend Kyle Lowry's minutes and not play James Johnson even though there was Tobias Harris out there, who's an absolute beast and needed someone, someone exactly like James Johnson to guard him, yet uh, James Johnson and his red hair remain glued to the pine. Yeah, the answer to the question is why didn't James Johnson play more minutes? The answer to that question is right. <laughs> what? Uh, I, like, like yes, yes. I don't. No one knows. There's no one who has provided a good answer to that question. Mm. I think it has something to do with whatever it was that Landry Fields did. I think that James Johnson sided with Landry. I think that that's what he's done. <laughs> James Johnson is on team fields, and that is not where you want to be mm. if you want Casey to put you into that game. Yeah, yeah. It's almost like a words with friends game gone bad. I think something. something. There, yeah. I don't know. Playing dice on the plane. It's yeah. something's gone bad. Nobody knows, man. This is a question that the pod has been trying to answer for quite some time now. Uh, very unsuccessfully, I might add. Uh, mm-hmm. I think we had some a lot of different theories, uh, some locker room trouble, maybe maybe J- yeah. the old James Johnson returned uh, between them. There was some he- of Johnson and Casey having long heart to heart conversations. Yeah. And then there was Johnson helping too much. But then again, if you're going to punish James Johnson for being a bad defender, Jesus, what are you going to do with Grievous Vasquez and about everybody else on the team? Yeah. So we don't really have answers to this question. Only o- only more questions, which which isn't very helpful right now. Yeah. All right. Uh up next uh, is uh, uh, from uh, – I, I don't like these usernames, man. It, like if you got an underscore in your username, what's up with that? Like right. come on, man. Okay. This is from at Osipov underscore AO who goes, um, predict Terrence Ross's performance in the playoffs. Will he disappear again? Um, well, he disappeared last time against the Nets, uh, but I think well, – uh, well, he, he also made some pretty big plays at the end of game seven. He did. He did. He he made that steal uh, against Pierce, I think, and then uh, yeah, he he made a couple. But overall, for the series, um, you know, he wasn't. I didn't think that he was put in a position to succeed. I think no. guarding uh, Paul Pierce uh, is and and uh, and Johnson are never easy tasks. And uh, asking the second year guy to do that, you know, it's it's probably not going to work out. And but the question he's is, up, yeah. I think he's giving up three, two or three inches and about thirty pounds to each of those guys too. Mm. So yeah, answer the question, uh, Andrew. Yeah, predict his performance in the playoffs, assuming it's Milwaukee, uh, who have the lengthy guys who can't really shoot. Um, Terrence Ross kind of fits that bill based on his play these days. Uh, Terrence can shoot, man. I, th- I think that I think he plays. I think he plays better than expected, and I think that what really kills has killed him in the past, and especially last year, is. If he doesn't start out well or if he starts, you know, with his head down a little bit, if he's not playing aggressive, then Casey just yanks him and that takes whatever fractured self-confidence he has and breaks it. Mm. And I think that Casey has demonstrated after basically eliminating him from the lineup in coming forward from that, it seems like he's accepted that he needs to have Ross play a role on this team. 
And the fact that Casey seems to have acknowledged that leads me to believe that he's going to get a little bit of a longer rope from the bench. And he's he's got, you know, the, the team is willing to invest a little bit more of their offense in him. And that being the case, I think he has an opportunity to not shine, but be more relevant and more present than he was in the past. And like we mentioned this a little bit earlier, that he has been given a longer leash over the last couple of weeks. Like you see him handling the ball a bit more. He's making a lot of bounce passes, some of them just really bad ones, uh, and some of them have come off. Uh, at the same time, I just don't see him being that kind of player in the playoffs. I, I don't think you can play him at the point forward or ask him to handle the ball or no. you know, become creative. I think the only way he can realistically contribute in playoff series is through his three-point shooting. And... Uh, that's kind of hit and miss right now. Like he's, you see a lot of one for fours, two for sixes in his game right now, which is not, which is not good because we need him shooting around 40% to be really effective. So like, if you had to ask me what his performance in the playoffs will be, even against uh, an inexperienced team like Milwaukee that has had a chance to scout the Raptors, I'd say he's going to struggle to get his three point shot off because Milwaukee can cover a lot of ground really fast, especially on the perimeter. So there's going to be a greater onus on or greater pressure on Terrence Ross to actually put it on the, put it on the floor and take it to the rim, something he hasn't been able to do this year. So I don't see a Milwaukee series being great for Terrence Ross. I mean, he's shooting 38% from three. He is, he has off and on nights for sure, but it's, he is shooting well on the season from three. Um, I think there's something to that. Milwaukee can take that away, but I think that if the Raptors are able to initiate their offense a little bit sooner and break things down, and I think the fact that Milwaukee is going to be selling out on the the side dribble handoffs to try and take away Lowry and take away DeRozan from what they want to do, there's going to be a chance for Ross to get some open shots out of that. Mm. All right. All right. Let, let, let's hope that's the case. Yeah. Uh, the next one comes from uh, at Leban Star one and he asks... Um, What's up with Patrick Patterson's poor shooting since March? So uh, Patterson on the season is shooting 37% from three, which is fantastic. But uh, since March, he's at uh, 29% from three, uh, which is a significant drop off because uh, that's been his primary contribution this year in the offensive end is, is, is being a stretch four. Um, but if you ask me, overall, his play has been, I think, more impressive over the last month and a half. Defensively, he's been much more aware, much more active. Uh, his offensive game has diversified a bit. He's doing a lot more. I think I mentioned earlier, like driving and pulling up, uh, driving to the rim. I think. I think. I think overall, I've I've enjoyed Patrick Patterson over the last month more than I've had just him standing on the perimeter and shooting. And granted, the percentages haven't been that great, Andrew. But it's it's he's being effective in different ways. Yeah, I mean he's. He's playing more minutes than he's ever played in his career. I don't know if that's maybe wearing on a little bit. He's just getting a little tired, a little worn down. He's he's playing much more actively on defense than I certainly ever saw him play well last season or definitely when he was with Houston or Sacramento before. So it could just be that he's – I mean, it's a long, long season. He could just be getting a little tired, a little worn down. He seems a little hesitant to shoot sometimes, like maybe he wants to move the ball or, or he's kind of shooting because he knows that he's supposed to. Could be that. I mean, mm. he's shot poorly, but then look, last season he shot 23% in uh, in the games he played from three for Sacramento, and then he came here and he shot 41% for us. So, yeah, and, could be streaks, could be tired. It's hard to say. Yeah, and also to note, like even though he's shooting poorly, his assists, steals, blocks, rebounds have all gone up since March. So it's not just that he's he's shooting poorly and now he's a negative. He's he's doing other stuff that that I'd say is even more valuable because three point shooting is nice and we need him to hit big shots. But I think the pressure to win Casey puts on his players defensively. Patterson's kind of stepped up to the challenge and uh, and accepted that. And I, I have no problem with Patterson. I, I wish he hits more of his uh, threes, but. I'd much prefer that he fakes the three, goes in, and does something else because he's a decent passer uh, when he's at the elbow or when he's in the paint. So I, I'd like to see more of that than just three-point shooting from him. For sure. And it's worth noting the team, like, teams are still respecting him yeah. in, defensively as if he's hitting 40%. Like, exactly. They're not leaving him wide open. He's drawing a forward or a big man all the way out to the three-point line. So even if he's not hitting, just the fact that he's got the gravity pulling someone out there opens up a lot of floor for other guys. Mm. 
All right, two more questions to go. Uh, this one comes from Rapsfeed. He asks, uh, can we beat the Cavs in the second round? If not, how many games do we win? Well, man, we got to get through the first round first. But uh, I guess, I guess uh, us facing Milwaukee has a, a lot of fans optimistic now, uh, especially given their inexperienced uh, uh, playoffs. Uh, so, I don't know. You want to take this one? Sure. The answer is no. And the answer is maybe one. There you go, man. Uh, well, regular season, we were 3-1 and one against them, I believe. Sure, we won one yeah. game and we and we lost the rest. So uh, there is no reason to think that will change in the playoffs. And we when we beat them, we did so before that, like when they were in their their nineteen and twenty stretch, before they made the trades, before they figured it out, before yeah. LeBron took two weeks off, went to South Beach, and suddenly became LeBron again. Mm. Uh, let's take one last one. This is from uh, at Mike Armis four, and he asks, uh, "Has Casey done enough as of late to keep his job?" Uh, I don't know if his job was in danger at all. Andrew, what do you think? Um, yeah, I'm not sure if his job was in danger based on his contract structure and the fact that I don't know if the team is going to be the same next year or where management feels about him. But I also think that heading down the run of a an okay regular season is not really where you figure out whether he's going to keep his job because if the Raptors lose in six games to Milwaukee – I think that that storyline is much different. If the Raptors make it to the second round and take two or three games from Atlanta or the the Cavs, then that's another different storyline the other way. So Mm -hmm. I don't think you're going to be able to answer that question right now. Yeah. TBD on that one at Mike Armas 4. I think uh, that wraps up the uh, Twitter segment. Uh, Let's come back and and talk about Milwaukee and um, some other stuff. three of Raptors Weekly. Uh, we're going to talk some uh, Milwaukee at this point. But before we do that, we have a rant we want to go on. Uh, and that's uh, <laughs> auto-playing video on websites. What's up with that, Andrew? Like, wh- what? what website designer goes, you know what? People are coming to my website. I'm going to blast a video and audio, regardless of whether they're at work or at home or putting a kid to bed or what have you. It's just disregard for just uh, yeah, uh, for other humans. Yeah, let's someone in a coffee shop. Let's do that. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that's... Uh, you know that that's that's uh, some advice or some uh, design practices you might want to take from the porn industry who would never do that. They would no, just exactly. never do that. Yeah. Don't just don't alienate your client base. Like like as far as marketing, like you want someone to remember something, notice it. If you have a if there's a there's a page sometimes that I want to watch something or read, and if you there's a video that I can't just get to shut off, I'll just close it. I'll punt on it. I don't care. I'm yeah. not putting up with that video. Yeah. TSN is is pretty bad at that. Like their uh, their articles, you're trying to look at the like a you know some quotes the uh, a coach said, and next thing you know you're, you're getting a video about uh, about some hockey thing. And, oh God, all right. Yeah, all these pages and on Facebook, it's the same. You know, like I feel this this is a conspiracy from the from Rogers and Bell. They've they somehow arranged for this just because anyone who uses a smartphone to do most of their surfing has seen their data plans just explode with all of this auto loading video all the time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, th- there goes uh, Rogers as a sponsor for this podcast, but uh, okay. Yeah, all right, all right. Uh, Milwaukee, Milwaukee, Milwaukee brings us. Uh, let's go through the roster briefly. Uh, Ilya Sova, who Raptor fans have uh, swooned over in the past. Uh, we got uh, Antetokounmpo, who is a uh, uh, a beast, a uh, lengthy beast, a uh, long arm beast. Uh, we'll talk about him in a bit. They got Zaza Pachulia, a veteran, uh, yeah. crafty what, veteran. What, what I'd are say. the most fun names in the NBA to say, if not the most fun? Hmm. And then you have uh, Michael Carter Williams, the uh, the second year point guard who they got from Philly, uh, raw, talented, tall, lengthy, uh, but uh, very inexperienced. One of the worst shooters to yeah. ever play yeah. as a starter. Yeah. Then you got uh, Chris Middleton, who's actually a half decent shooter. I guess he's probably their best. He's just a good uh, shooter. Player. Yeah. Uh, and then you got a, and then you and you go down to uh, O'Brien, uh, Jared Dudley, who's a good defender, uh, Plumley, and. Uh, and, and Canadian Tyler Ennis as well. So, and then we got former point guard uh, Jared Bayless, and of course OJ Mayo is hanging on there. So, um, it's not a scary looking roster. Like when you look at the Washington roster, uh, you, you know some names kind of jump out at you, like John Wall and um, uh, and Nene. But looking at the Bucks roster, it's really the sum of the parts that's kind of scary, not the actual parts themselves. Yeah, I mean they, they've focused in on what they do really well. But they're they're a team of, of- polarity they are either very good at something or very very bad at it they're the, i think the fourth ranked team in in defensive efficiency 
and they get turnovers and they have a lot of length and they run around the floor and they're very, very well coached and surprisingly well disciplined on defense based on the, their, the age of their starting lineup. Uh, they know what they can do and they do a very good job of it. On the other hand, they are the, I think, fifth worst offensive team in the league. They are the second worst team as far as turning the ball over. They have commit the second most turnovers in the league and they don't, they play at a league average uh, pace. So it's not like that's contributing to that. So they turn the ball over a ton and they do not score, hmm. but so, they, they hold teams from scoring as well. So I guess looking at the Raptors Achilles heel, which has been their defense all season long, Milwaukee's a team that's not going to immensely test that just because their offense is so bad. So you would have to think that the Raptors catch a break here because they, they may be able to defend like average averagely or, or play below average defense yet get away with it just because the quality of the uh, opponent's uh, offense. Yeah. And especially the type of offense that they play in Milwaukee, just because they do not have a lot of shooting and teams can just completely lay off of Michael Carter Williams. Like the Michael Carter Williams trade made them a, like was a major offensive step backwards for them because Brandon Knight was initiating so much of their offense and he was shooting really well. And Michael Carter Williams does not do that. So being able to lay off of him allows a team like the Raptors who tries to trap aggressively and rotate and run around and run people off the three point line. When they play a team like Atlanta who moves the ball around really well and will break you down, they give up a buttload of wide open three pointers. But against a team like Milwaukee, where you can have a little bit of a release valve there with Michael Carter Williams, and they don't really have a great deal of shooting unless they're playing someone like Jared Dudley at the four or through Chris Middleton. There are a couple guys you can kind of lay off, Giannis as well, and that allows you to move around and help in a way that the Raptors like to do without getting exposed the way they have in the past. Yeah. And just look at briefly individual matchups here. Uh, you know, DeMar DeRozan obviously is, uh, is our best player right now, and he's usually being guarded by the opposing team's best defender. At this point, looking at the, at the Bucks roster, who do, you, who do you see that being? Um, I think he's either going to be guarded by Middleton or Giannis. I'm not sure. Mm. And I, don't, I don't know if they have like a shutdown guy so much as they just they play really well team. Yeah, exactly. They don't have that Damari Carroll or uh, a Tony Allen type player. Despite despite all these guys being long and uh, and defensive minded, they don't have that one individual player who will just d you up and just take you out of the game. Um, the closest that I could come was was actually Middleton uh, because I I don't think they want to have Giannis guard Demar Derozan because they kind of need his offense and it kind of it, it might drain the guy a little bit. But but who knows? Uh, it would be interesting to see if they put Giannis on him. Just if Demar is is isolating a lot and trying to get that that turnaround or fadeaway jumper and really trying to get work that game putting Giannis on him in an iso situation with that at least makes it very difficult for DeMar to shoot over him mm. that forces DeMar to drive to the basket where they can kind of give help so they mm. might try something like that yeah so yeah that's definitely gonna be an interesting matchup and Jonas Valanciunas at the center going against Pachulia uh, Jonas actually wakes up for European centers but Pachulia is, he, he's crafty right I mean we, we, we saw Jonas really struggle with uh, with fouls over the last couple of games and Pachulia is one of those guys that if you don't watch out, he'll just pump fake you, shoulder fake you, and you're going to pick up two quick fouls very early. So the game planning there has to be pretty exact for, for Valanciunas. And Valanciunas really needs to be disciplined and not pick up those early fouls if he wants to stay in the game. Because with Pachulia uh, and, and, the, and the, um, the driving offense that, that the Bucks have, the take it to the rim, it's, it's going to put a lot of pressure on JV, and he's got to be really disciplined. He's got to be patient defensively. And I think that a part of the game plan is going to be going to, to Jonas in the post early and often in, in, in games just to try to alternatively take it to Pachulia, to take it to the Milwaukee's interior defenders and to try to put them on their heels as far as fouls go. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't be surprised to see that. Mm -hmm. uh, and then this is some other interesting matchups that kind of pop up. Are, uh, we talked about uh, Terrence Ross going up against uh, the length of Milwaukee's defense, but but off the bench, you got uh, Lou Williams, obviously, for the Raptors. And uh, for them, they got, uh, you know, I guess a poor man's Lou Williams, former Raptor Jared, Jared Bayless, Bayless. Yeah, right? I mean, that's a that's a pretty uh, – that's a decent comparison. Obviously, Lou Williams is having a much better season. But, uh, you know, Bayless, as we've seen, is capable of going into Lou mode and getting you 25, 26 a night. Yeah, I think what we're going to see when Jared Bayless and Lou Williams guard each other is a lot of guys taking a lot of wide-open shots. Mm. <laughs> and they're going to shoot often and they're going to get looks. Yeah. 
Uh, anything else? Like we will talk more about the series, uh, obviously on next week's pod when things are firmed up a little bit. But uh, anything else to be kind of scared of, uh, Andrew, uh, with the box? Anything to be concerned of, I should say, uh, uh, when you, when you look at the box? Guys like John Henson and sort of the the length and athleticism that they can put at the four and five spots mm-hmm. from Milwaukee. Toronto doesn't have any any fours or fives that are long that move like this sort of glide and move quickly and well. Like you know, Amir has been plotting for 16 months now on those ankles. Uh, Patterson, I guess, moves maybe the best out of any of the bigs, but you know he's six nine. He's not without the, the same kind of length that those guys have. So mm. it could be a little bit of of length and speed against strength as far as Milwaukee versus Toronto's bigs go, which could be interesting. Yeah, and uh, uh, rebounding. Just talk about rebounding a little bit. The Raptors right now, in in terms of uh, DRB percentage, are are twenty fourth, and uh, the Bucks are twenty second. So neither are great at uh, at taking care of the defensive boards. And like, if you have Amir Johnson and Hansbro in there, who when given playing time, uh, when Amir is healthy and Hansbro is given playing time, they're capable of of really getting some key rebounds and really hustling on the offensive glass. So I see that being a potential advantage for the Raptors. But uh, again, that, that kind of is kind of offset by Jason Kidd and the coaching he'll do. I'm sure he'll, he'll, uh, he'll make them aware that uh, he'll prepare them basically to, uh, for what the Raptors have to offer. So Andrew coaching edge, who gets it for the series? Uh, Milwaukee. I think Milwaukee Damn. has better staff in general. Mm. I think, I, I mean, I think Jason Kidd is getting a lot of credit for having a very good, assistant coaching staff around him and i think he's probably a a good coach in his own right but the way that they have adapted their defenses they were the ones who came up with the defense that was basically the mold for how to beat the raptors that was working really well this season as well which is just taking away those the dribble handoffs on the side and really slowing down the raptors offense Mm -hmm. um i think they're going to do that again and i mean i don't think either of these guys especially with the the lineups they have are going to be drawing up brilliant offensive sets but Hmm. And just one thing to point out before we kind of close the Milwaukee talk is that they are the fifth youngest team in the league. Uh, 24.6 is the average age. The Raptors, by the way, are 26.1, so uh, a bit more experience. But the Bucks also have very limited playoff experience, almost almost nothing, I'd say, uh, across their roster. I haven't gone through every player, but really they're, they're hurting on that end. So... Uh, uh, that's, that's the area that I say the Raptors based on what they experienced last year might have the edge there because every, you, you don't see many teams make the playoffs for the first time and then start winning playoff rounds. So that's kind of got me hopeful that the Raptors really have a chance here. And something that to watch as well is that in the playoffs, the game is really going to slow down a lot. It's going to be a lot of half court and a lot of driving, a lot of guys like Lowry and DeRozan taking over. And Milwaukee does a very bad job of getting to the line in their offense. They don't shoot a lot of free throws, especially as a percentage of their field goal attempts. And the Raptors shoot one of the mo- the highest percentage of free throws. And the Milwaukee Bucks give up one of the most – like they're one of the – they give up more free throws than almost any other team in the league. Mm. So that aspect of their defense where they're reaching and they're, they're rotating around, they could really get punished very quickly. And I, you could see guys like Larry and DeRozan and Lou Williams living at the line the first couple games of the series. Yeah, that's that's a great point. Uh, the Raptors are fourth in the league, actually, for uh, free throw over uh, – so free throws per uh, field goal attempts. And that's prim- primarily due to uh, DeMar DeRozan's play. Uh, so, yeah, great point. I think the Bucs are kind of poor at preventing guys from getting the line. The Raptors are actually great at that. So combine that with experience, I'd say uh, I'd give the Raptors the edge. Uh, James Herbert asked me last time uh, – who I would pick in a Wizards Raptors series, and I said Wizards in six. Uh, for for Milwaukee, early call, Andrew. What do you think? Uh, I would say Raptors in five. Same here, man. I'd say Raptors in five as well. Uh, they might they might uh, lose a game in Milwaukee, but I think they can close it off back at the, at their home court. Yeah, I, I think Milwaukee's spry. They have pluck, but I just don't. I think it's a bad matchup, a worse matchup than people think, and I think that I just don't like gambling on on youth that can't shoot in the playoffs all right all right man i think uh we've covered all the bases for this week's pod we'll be back next week uh with a more detailed playoff preview uh against milwaukee or maybe even washington who knows but uh the playoffs are coming and uh, it's good times to be a raptor fan hey hey six of eight 48 wins andrew give me a smile all right it's game of thrones day i've had that smile on my face oh the first five episodes have been leaked though did you hear about that uh, no. Come yeah, on. somebody leaked the first Come five on. episodes. Come on. Yeah. I do not trust the internet not to spoil these five episodes for me. I'm very upset. Mm. Thanks for wiping the smile off my face, Sarah. <laughs> I was optimistic about the Raptors. I was going to make peace with Tyler Hansbro. Now it's done. It's all mm. over. 
let's have a culture segment on the podcast. Uh, what are your other two favorite shows, Andrew? Let's open a culture segment of the podcast. Two favorite shows. You know what my favorite new show is? I just started watching Banshee this week. I don't know Banshee. if a lot of people have seen Banshee. It mm. kind of has gone under the radar, HBO and Cinemax in the States. Mm. Really, really good action series. A lot of fun. That that sounds like a yeah, like a wolves type uh, werewolves type is that what it, it is? Yeah. It's um it's like a, an outlaw becomes a sheriff in a town that is a small Pennsylvania town consumed by Amish organized re- crime. Mm. Uh, right now for me, uh, I'm uh, I'm focusing on the Americans, which okay, is uh, fantastic. Yeah, and then uh, Better Call Saul, uh, which is the uh, spinoff of uh, Breaking Bad, which is uh, which are both fantastic. And I just finished watching House of Cards, which was disappointing. A little Very bit, disappointing. yeah. Very just... dis- underwhelming at the end, definitely. You know, weird watch of the week. Watch, listeners, go on Netflix and look up a show called Danger 5. I'm not even going to begin explaining it. Just watch it and, and enjoy the absurdity that is Danger 5. Danger 5. All Danger right, f- man. That's the uh, that that's going to be the episode title for the podcast. Great. Do well, people. Do well, people.